evening, everyone. Oh, it's good to be in church. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Outstanding job. God sent us the best. Praise God with Matt and Sarah Winter. Praise the Lord. How about praise the Lord? All right, you drove all the way here. You might as well stay awake. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Well, if you have your Bible, go with me to James chapter 1, verse 22, please. I'm teaching on this subject of faith. I'm going to continue to teach on this subject of faith until the Lord directs me otherwise. And uh, I'm excited about it. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm teaching a series now that I just started, I think, kind of last week. And I'm talking about the fundamentals of faith. Faith, um, fundamentally, is really pretty easy. <laughs> uh, when you approach God's Word by faith in your heart rather than by your head, you will find God's Word to work out every time in your life. You'll find that it's much easier than you probably perhaps thought. And a lot of times our thinking gets in the way of our faith. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, Minister Leslie just really hit the nail on the head. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Is that right? That's what we just read. With all your heart, trust in him with all your heart. Well, from your heart is the place where faith resides and where faith flows from. Faith is a spiritual force that is given to us by God. It is part of the spirit of God, who God is. God is a faith God. God's not a doubting God. Amen? Amen. <laughs> God's not a, a guessing God. God's not a gambling God. God's not a, you know, one day this way, one day that way, one day up, one day down. That's not who God is. Hallelujah. Well, you need to know who God is. You need to know his nature. Because that very nature is who you are. It's who you are as a born-again believer. It is, it is part of your spirit as a Christian is to believe. That's how you're designed and created to be, is to be a believer. If you, want, if you understand one thing about the enemy, is he, he tries to get you to believe in something that is not true. We call it unbelief, but it's actually kind of believing in something that's not true, believing in a lie. It started in the garden. He lied. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. But faith, you'll find out that faith is really just a part of who you are. It really just sort of comes spiritually to you. <laughs> I say that like that because have you ever said or heard the expression, man, it just comes naturally? Well, faith just comes spiritually. <laughs> it's just part of your spirit. The only thing that gets in the way of just walking and living by faith in even a greater measure is typically your head, your thinking, your thoughts. And that's what the enemy tries to do is he tries to bombard people in the areas of their thoughts and in their mind to keep them from walking and living by faith. So that's why I want to teach on this series, The Fundamentals of Faith, because faith it should be fundamentally a part of our everyday Christian life. Amen? Amen? And what I'm talking about last week and again this week is producing measurable results. Mm -hmm. Producing measurable results. Faith produces measurable results. When faith is applied, there are measurable results when faith's there. If you're kind of like, 
If you ever get frustrated about something, don't ever get frustrated at God because it's not God's fault. Amen. <laughs> when a person is applying faith to any situation, frustration should never be a part of the process. Hallelujah. And so we're going to jump into this right here, and I'm going to get started because there's some stuff that I, I hope we get to cover tonight if we have time to do so. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word. Now we open our heart to receive from you. I ask you now to help me to minister your word with accuracy and with boldness. And that we are not just hearers of the word, but we are doers of the word. I thank you, Lord, that you help me to minister not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in power and in demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And that signs, wonders, and great miracles follow the word preached tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So here in James chapter 1 verse 22, it says, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. You must do what it says. Say that with me. You must do what it says. When you are what, what we, what, doing what it says, I like to call it being a doer of the word, right? Because he says, don't just listen to what it says. Do what it says, right? That, a doer of the word, you could say, is where the rubber meets the road, right? It, it's the... Uh, it's the, it's the action. It's the, it's, man, that's really the fun part, frankly. <laughs> because, I mean, yeah, you can hear, you can hear the word, you can read the word and all that stuff. But then when you are a doer of the word, glory to God. That's, that's exciting because now you're like, man, I'm actually doing this. I'm actually applying what I've been hearing, what I've been learning, what I've been listening to, the spirit of the Lord speak to my heart to do. I'm doing it by faith. There's a certain excitement that comes on the inside of you when you are a doer of the Word of God. Amen? He says, don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. He says, otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. You're only what? It doesn't even say the enemy's fooling you. It says you're fooling yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't want to fool myself. <laughs> I got enough challenges without fooling myself. I want to be a doer of the word. Hey, man, sometimes you just got to, you know, you just need to be honest with yourself and listen to your own heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Amen? Oftentimes, he'll remind me of this very thing right here. He'll say things like, you know better than that. <laughs> you know better than that, right? I mean, it's just little, just little things, you know, you begin to talk a certain way or even think a certain way or something about that. And you, you can find like discouragement or doubt trying to creep in or something like that. You know better than that. And what am I reminded to do there? Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. Amen. If you're wondering why you're not getting results, you need to check your doing. A lot of people don't want to check their doing. They want to check with God and say, God, how come you're not doing this? <laughs> Faith isn't getting God to do something. God's already done everything he's going to do. Faith appropriates what God's already done. Amen? So he says, be a doer of the word, otherwise you're fooling yourselves. Now, faith, I talked about this last week in opening comments. Faith, it produces a certain type of atmosphere. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in something like maybe, you know, like maybe a, a, in athletics, on a, any, any type of team. Uh, it doesn't have to be in sports. It could be maybe you're trying to accomplish a common goal at work or something like that. 
But have you ever been a part of two different types of teams at different times? And one team had an absolute belief that you were going to accomplish this common goal, right? (laughs) And if you've ever been on a team that's kind of like all of a sudden, it really kind of just takes one naysayer, one doubting person, one person that says, well, I don't know, I don't know. And man, all of a sudden, you find out people just start, then they start second guessing and third guessing and questioning this and questioning that. And it always typically comes with these questions. And next thing you know, the whole team's discouraged. You see, faith creates a certain environment. And in that environment of faith, I find it very conducive to hear from the Spirit of God. And I'm not talking about necessarily it has to be all these people around you. I'm talking about in your own personal life. You can be driving down the road and you can either create an environment of faith or you can be complaining about this and talking about that and thinking about this and being discouraged and filled with doubt and unbelief, whatever else. I mean, it'll just creep in any old place you let it or you can put a stop to it. Amen? And you can say, no, 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 no. That's not how I think. That's not how I believe. And you begin to speak God's word. You begin to proclaim God's word. I mean things such as, you know, no, 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 no. I, I, I will live, I will not die, and I will declare the works of the Lord. You satisfy me with long, healthy, prosperous life. My youth is renewed like the eagle. Amen. I mean, you can just go on and on, and you just uh, let the Word of God just begin to flow out of you. When when you let the Word of God flow out of you, you'll find that it begins to create an atmosphere of faith in your own heart and in your own life and wherever you're at. And that atmosphere of faith, it is not dependent on any external circumstances. An environment of faith can happen anywhere under any circumstances. It can look absolutely bleak. It can look like there's no hope. But an atmosphere of faith can be cultivated and created no matter where you're at, no matter what you're facing. You say amen to that. You need to know that. Well, it's just been so hard. Well, then change it. Well, what what do I have to do with it? (laughs) You have everything to do with it. You're very important. God knows that, and so does your enemy. He knows Satan knows, whether you know it or not, he knows that believers carry this mighty force of faith within themselves. And he's always on the brink of danger with you on this earth. Because he does know that the believer can wield the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and when they do that by faith, Now they're not just a hearer of the word, but they're a doer of the word. No longer are they fooling themselves, right? But they're actually doing damage to the kingdom of darkness. And they're actually progressing the kingdom of God. Satan does not like the kingdom of God. Satan does all he can to stop the kingdom of God, but he cannot stop the kingdom of God, ultimately, And you and I are to put forth effort in our life by faith to see that the kingdom of God is being manifested through our life. Remember the disciples said, well, where where, where should we see this kingdom? Where is this kingdom? Shall we say, lo, it's here, lo, there? He says, no, the kingdom of God is within you. See, you are a, a, a carrier of the kingdom of God. That kingdom, you are a representative of that kingdom and you have been given authority in that kingdom. He is the king 
and you were under his kingdom leadership. And it's so important to him that he chose not to put an angel in your life, although you have angels, but to give you his very own personal spirit to give you the leadership required to carry out that kingdom in this earth. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He says, if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, say, do what it says. Do what it says. There again, do what it says. You know, there is such a thing as practical application. <laughs> Meaning, you hear the word, you hear faith being taught, then just go out and apply it. Just, just begin to use, use it, apply it to your life. Don't just put it on a shelf and wait and say, well, you know, someday if I ever need that, you know, now I know where to go to. No, when that day comes you'll not be used to using faith. Faith isn't to be put on a shelf and used someday. Faith is designed to be used every day of your life. Amen. That's why we live and walk by faith. Amen. Amen. And so <clears throat> he says here again a second time, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So you have to put the word to work in your life. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Now, let's go again and look at this in Luke chapter 5. And um, let's go to verse 1. Luke 5, 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, say, hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Nesret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and talked the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Say a great catch. Great. Say increase. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Glory to God. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. See, there, right there, is a key to the fundamentals of faith. At thy word. Acting in response to the word is the fundamental key to faith. Amen. Now, you know, we can come, we can hear this, we can say amen, <laughs> and we can walk out of here and just forget that. We can walk out of here and just absolutely not apply it to our life. One little thing can come across your mind. One little thing can pop up on your phone. And, and basically, almost undo all the faith you heard in service tonight. Some people, no, well, that, that couldn't be. Well, then you need to go read the parable of the sower again. Because it can choke it out and make it unfruitful in your life. If you're here, you might as well listen. And if you listen, you might as well be a doer of the word. And you might as well plan on doing it right away. Because there is something about practical application. Even if you don't have a problem in the world, go out there and practically apply faith to your life and to, your, and to whatever situation you can find. It. Begin to look for opportunity to use faith. Don't run from opportunity to use faith. Look for an opportunity to use faith. Amen? I like what uh, uh, one minister, um, I believe it was Keith Moore, I heard this years ago. They were in a, in a country, 
I believe it was a South American country, if I, if I have it correct, and uh, some type of civil war or something to that effect broke out, and uh, great unrest, and they begin to hear uh, uh, fighting, and I think it was shooting and some other things going on, and they were down there for some type of, you know, for ministry work, and uh, some of the uh, people begin to say, well, man, should we, should we get out of here? It seems like we need to leave, and we need to go. And uh, I, I don't remember who was all involved, but the point was this. They didn't all leave. I mean, maybe some left. I, I don't recall exactly. But the point was this. The safest place to be is right in the center of God's will for your life. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will for your life. That'll help you. That'll, that'll keep you solid when things around you are crumbling. That'll keep you firm when there's great storms and great adversity coming at you. You know, if you go back and read Luke chapter 6, Verse 46, 47, in that area there, 48. Again, he says, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say, right? He goes, let me show you what it's like to a man who builds his house upon the rock, right? He comes to me, he hears my saying, and he does them. And then he goes on to describe that, hey, when the floods rise, and the wind comes, he stands firm. Is that right? See, part of that process is digging deep there. And so we see that there's got to be something about us to be willing to stand, to be willing to dig deep, to be willing to sort of hold our ground, if you will. I believe it was Kenneth Hagin Sr. said, if you're willing to stand forever, you won't have to stand very long. I believe the enemy knows that. I believe the enemy begins to see that when he sees that resolve in you and you're not willing to, to back down. When I say back down, I mean back down to the enemy. You say, well, how do you back down to the enemy? With your confession. With the words that come out of your mouth. That's how you begin to identify if you're backing down. You can find out what kind of foundation you have in your own life by listening to the words that you say out of your own mouth. Great amen in here. A great roar swept across the crowd. <laughs> Hallelujah. He says, launch out into the deep, for a, 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 let your nets down for a draught. Master, we've toiled all night and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So again, that's the, one of the key fundamentals of faith is being a doer of the word. Is that right? And when they had done this, and when they had done this, and when they had done this, let me say it like this, and when they were a doer of the word, they stopped fooling themselves. <laughs> when they were a doer of the word, when they had done this, they enclosed what? Oh, don't, you don't have to act like you're that tired. Come on. A great multitude of fishes <laughs> and their net break. <laughs> Glory to God. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in other ships, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships. And they filled what? Just by being a doer of the word. Just by saying, nevertheless, at thy word. Amen? So that they began to sink. I like to say, you know how you get a net breaking, boat sinking load of fish? Just simply be a doer of the word. That's how you walk an increase. You want more than enough? Just be a doer of the word. 
Nevertheless, Lord, at your word. Nevertheless, at your word. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to be a tither. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to be a giver. Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to walk by faith. I'm not going to talk about the problem. I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm just going to be nevertheless at that word. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, a Christian's life was never meant to be lived without increase. Go to Hebrews. Uh, well, we looked at this last. Well, let's look at it again. Hebrews 5, 12. Praise God. I'm going to say it again. It was never meant that a believer's life should be lived without increase. Every born-again believer's life should see increase. Increase in every good thing. Amen? Hallelujah? Well, well, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied. Hey, I'm not, say, I'm not talking about being unsatisfied. I'm talking about increasing. Well, you know, um, I'm just not really all into that increasing thing. Hey, I didn't say you had to keep it for yourself. I mean, I, I really still don't, I, I really don't understand why people, Christians, resist increase or even a message about increase. The only way I know to really not like a message preached about increase is if you're selfish. Well, no, that's what I, I'm not trying to be selfish. Well, see, if you have a problem with increase, then you don't have giving on your mind, clearly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because all you're thinking about is, well, I don't need that much. Whoever said it was all for you? Hallelujah. You know, he promised Abraham, and, 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 and we're of the faith of Abraham, that he would be the lender, not the borrower, and that he would give to nations. I mean, our attitude should be that we are the lender, not the borrower. I have to remind myself of this on a regular basis. I thank you, Lord. I'm the lender, not the borrower. I'm the giver, not the taker. Amen? I mean, but... If you're not careful, you can quickly take on a hoarding mentality. I don't know about you, but I want to be a flow. I want to be a resource for God to flow through, right? I mean, he pours it in, I'm pouring it out. He pours it in, I'm pouring it out. I mean, every day, be thinking of other people's needs on your mind and how you can be a blessing to them. See, it begins to change your paradigm and the way you look at things. But what happens is a lot of people, they, all they can do is just, they, they, can, they can't even see beyond their own need. But I know that God wants you to get so beyond your own need. You say, well, why do you say that? Because God sent his son Amen. for the world. <laughs> Amen. Amen? I mean, his only begotten son. Why? Because he loved the world. The world was not very lovely when he sent his son. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, when you're a giver, you're imitating your father. We are told in Ephesians that we're to imitate our father as children imitate their father. Natural children imitate their natural father. We are to be an imitator of the father. Giving is part of imitating our Father. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, I have in Hebrews 5.12. You should have been believers, you have been, excuse me, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Let's just stop right there. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. You know what? This verse still applies. You know how many people, you know how many Christians there are in the world? 
You know how few of them are really in a place in their life that they are actually teaching others? I'll tell you, hardly any. Very few believers talk about the Lord outside of their Christian circles or their church. They don't talk about the Lord. They hear problems at work. Oh, did you hear what's going on now? Very few believers respond with a faith response that comes from God's word. Most of them just repeat the same stories they watched on a different television network. It's true. And here he says, he says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. This, this verse right here, probably 99% of Christians would not say that they're a baby. They would identify as being mature. And I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being critical. And I've got a long way to go and a lot to learn myself. Trust me, a long way to go. But it's amazing how few Christians respond by faith to world events. Tells me we're still acting like babies when we ought to be acting like mature believers. I still love you. You love me? Yeah. Okay, all right, we'll make sure, all right? Because it's getting really quiet in here. <laughs> you are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training, who through training, who through training, yeah. have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Through training. Hallelujah. You're being trained tonight. I know this is a Thursday crowd, so you guys are up for the training. I get it. I know it. You're not the, you're not the two-year crowd, Easter and Christmas crowd. You're the crowd that's willing to be trained the things of God. Amen? Amen. Willing be, to be trained to know what is right and what is wrong. Faith is a great separator. Because faith in God's word, God's word is so sharp. The Bible says it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Dividing asunder the soul from spirit. And when a person applies the word of God by faith, it immediately, right down the middle, will separate a believer from a doubter. A mature person to an immature person. One who is willing to be, to be a teacher to those that still need to be taught. Those who have dedicated themselves to be trained. And you know what you train? You train your senses. I said you train your senses. You allow the word of God to train your senses. A lot of people want their senses to indicate if the word is working or something like that. It's the op. That's, that's wrong. That's backwards. That's not how it works. We train in the things of God and the spirit of God to then train our senses. Do you know that the, the, in, in basically any type of uh, training, but if you were to train in like emergency procedures, um, let's say, it, let's just take like aviation for an example. I have a little bit of experience in there. So what do you do? You're training, you're training, you're training. You don't just do it one time, pass the test, go on your merry way, 
fly, fly forever. No, you have to stay current and you have to go back for, for, for more training and more training and more training. You're constantly being trained. Do you remember the man, the, the pilot um, who landed the aircraft on the Hudson River? <laughs> that was a miracle, right? But that man, not only did he train, he was a trainer. So while he's training others, he's being trained in himself. When the, the, they talked about the odds of success, they talked about how few pilots could have pulled that off. I mean, the number is amazingly low of the odds of success of that actually happening and being accomplished. You know, there wasn't one death. To my knowledge, I don't even know that anyone was even injured. And it isn't interesting that the person who pulled it off, not only had he been current in his training, but he was one who trained others. And here we read there in Hebrews about, you ought to be teaching others. There's nothing like getting it for yourself. As you're teaching others, you're hearing that word that's coming out of your own mouth. And guess how faith comes? By hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And you say, well, you know, I don't have it all together in my life, so be, I'm not going to say anything because I've, I've made some mistakes, and I don't have it all together, so I don't think I should be, you know, teaching someone. Hey, listen, I'm not saying you need a pulpit, but you can talk to the person at the bus stop. You can talk to the person at work. You can say, listen, I don't have it all together, but this is what I do know from the word. And I know that God is faithful, right? Wasn't that a beautiful song we sang about God's faithfulness tonight? Glory to God, he's faithful, 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 faithful. Don't worry about your faithfulness. I mean, okay, I don't mean that like don't be faithful. I'm just saying that don't look at your own uh, past and say, well, you know, I, I can't be a teacher. I can't talk. I don't want to talk to you. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I've, I've, I've talked to so many people, even this last year, about that. I'm like, well, you know, are you telling them what the word says about it? Well, no, because, you know, I feel like I got to get my life straightened up first. I'm like, well, what's going on in your life? Well, you, you know, I just, you know, you know, you know what that is? It's condemnation. And so because they're living in condemnation, they're really not willing to use faith to talk to somebody else about the Lord. Well, I want to get my life cleaned up first before that. And that's, I mean, yeah, you want to get your life cleaned up, but you're, you're, how long are you going to wait? Maybe by you stepping out in faith and begin to declare the word, now all of a sudden there's a level of accountability in your own life because now you're doing something by faith. So you just got to apply it by faith. You just got to begin to step out in fa by faith. You can be honest with them too. I mean, you don't have to say, hey, don't. You can just simply say, I don't have it all together, but I know the word of God works. And I know the word of God says this. And I know the word of God will put you over. And I know the word of God will sustain you. And I know the word of God this. And I know, see, it's not about you. It's about what the word says anyway. A lot of the times though, people get themselves in the way and they begin to look at their own self rather than looking at Jesus. Hallelujah. Solid food, amen? Go with me to, um, praise the Lord. I'm trying to remember where we left. Oh, I think I know where we left off. Thank you, Jesus. Go with me to Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. Joshua 6, 1. Say this with me. The fundamentals of faith. Isn't it amazing when you read your Bible and you see how easy victories were? It says, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. The Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given 
into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. <laughs> and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they have make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall flat, or shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Whew. Just think about it. Here's this place called Jericho with these mighty walls surrounding it, the enemy inside. They didn't own a bulldozer. They didn't own a cat D6 bulldozer. They didn't own a wrecking ball, right? What did they have? Well, we got, it's kind of like, what do you, what do you got? Well, I've got a, some priests with some horns and uh, some cymbals. <laughs> we can shout. I don't know how many you've ever, I'm not trying to promote this movie, but it reminds, <laughs> reminds me of a movie I saw years ago called, called The Three Amigos. <laughs> well, what do you people do really good? We sew. <laughs> you sew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll beat El Guapo with our sewing skills, right? <laughs> well, here, what, what can you do good? Well, you know, I mean, we can, we can blow a trumpet, you know. What we got to look at is this. So many people think that the only way they're going to get victory is if, they're, if they have something that they don't already have. And God knows what you already have. God knows what you're already capable of. And he always puts the ability for you to walk in victory with what you already have. Well, all I need is a million dollars. Then I can give ten dollars. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, he knows, he works with what you already have. you got to understand, it's not that that does the work. It's the faith in his word. It's just being a doer of the word is what produces the result. Feed them. Oh, we have a few fish and a few loaves. All he's looking for is faith in what you have. Well, I'm not good enough, and I'm not good looking enough, and I'm not tall enough, and I'm not going to have enough hair, and I don't have enough this, and I don't have enough that. Just give them what you got. Just be willing to use what you have by faith. Because the enemy will always see to it. And your mind oftentimes gets right in the way of faith. Faith is so fundamentally easy and simple to use. You just simply take God at his word and watch it begin to work for you. And you know the story. What did they do? So all, it says that, uh, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron consecrated unto the Lord, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Look at that. So the people shouted when the, when the priests blew with the trumpet in verse 20. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpets and, and the people shouting with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they took the city. And they took the city. God's people took the city. God's people can take Tarpon Springs. God's people can take Palm Harbor and Clearwater and Newport Ritchie and Port Ritchie and Hudson. God's people. Come on. And Tampa and St. Petersburg. Amen? 
and Orlando and Fort Lauderdale and Miami and Jacksonville and Atlanta. God's people. How are they going to do that? Simply by faith in God's word. If, if you have a heart for something like that and God's put it on your heart, you say, well, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, this, the, 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 it's the school board and it's the, it's the this and it's the that. Just go with what you got. Amen. Just believe, just listen to God, listen to his heart, begin to allow him to speak to your heart. You begin to walk in faith with what you have. You begin to speak God's word concerning it. Begin to grow. Allow your senses to be trained. See, that's a big thing. I, I, I didn't finish that point. This training is allowing God's word to lead us and the spirit of the, of the Lord to lead us rather than our senses to lead us. And that's where I was talking about that Captain Scully who landed that aircraft on the Hudson River. Most training is to overcome your senses. You can train on, really, on, on many different things because you want to do this rather than this, but you can, well, I, I feel like this. But you train to a place to where rather than just responding in fear, you respond based on what you've trained yourself to do. It's almost like you remove your thinking and you, you kind of kick into, I'm just talking about on the natural side of things, you, you, you kick into your training. And have you ever heard somebody who's trained and trained and trained and here now they, they face a situation and they say, you know, the training kicked in. It's just my training kicked in. And had they not had that training, they would have responded like, like they had before normally, but because they've trained, they took time and trained. Well, for us, we can train in the word of God. And a lot of, that's, you know, that's not a popular Christian word, train in the things of God. What are you training? What is this? You know, no, you literally, you, you train your, your spirit, right? And you train your senses to respond to your spirit rather than what they want to do, rather than what they want to say, <laughs> rather than what your mind wants to say, rather than what you, what you feel at that moment, right? Rather than maybe what the bank account looks like or what this looks like or what they say to you, ah, tell them, give them a piece of my mind. You can't afford it. Don't do it. <laughs> respond with the word. Amen. Well, how do you get there? Well, you, really, you literally train in the things of the word. Amen. Well, this is something that we just ongoingly do. It's kind of like reoccurring. You go back. I do this. I mean, for myself. I don't even do it as much as I'd like to do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting back and some things back in my life. And, you know, like little things that I want to stay sharp in, Right? You want to stay sharp? You literally can stay sharp spiritually. And if you, if you just listen to your heart and what the Spirit of the Lord is telling you, you, you'll see how you can get kind of dull, so to speak, in an area of your life, sort of lethargic, you know. And so you know what I'll do? I'll go and I'll go find some good faith teaching on a particular subject and I'll go listen to it. And I'll listen to it over and over and over and over again. In fact, I did it last night. I felt so energized. Oh, man, I was so excited. I just, I, I just, that's what the Word of God will do to you. I mean, it was like 1.30 or 2 in the morning. I was, I was so fired up. I about woke my wife up. <laughs> you know what I did? I just went out, began to work, do a project, but I just listened to the Word. I don't know how long I was out there, two, three four hours, something like that, just listen to the word, just listen to the word, just listen to the word being preached in faith and, and, it, and it, something that I was desiring to kind of just, you know, you just, I don't know how to explain it, but there's something that you just feel like, I got to grab a hold of that. I got to kind of get my mind renewed back to that. And, and man, this world, this world's a, I don't know how to say it, but it's like a suck on you. You know, it just, it just tries to just, you know, suck faith out of you and just, you know, just trying to, you know, 
You got to get in the Word and allow the Word of God to build you back up and, you know, it feeds you. It's like, it's like food. You know, the Bible describes, you know, and, and you know what? I was so nourished. I was so built up. I was, man, I didn't even want to go to bed. Why? Because that's what the Word does. And it's like you, you have this spiritual appetite. You'll find as you grow into things, you, you find, you know, people have a natural appetite. Well, you have a spiritual appetite if you pay attention. And I, my, my spiritual appetite, I was hungry last night. Amen. I began to train last night. I was in training. <laughs> Man, I'd just stop for a minute, and I'd just pray in, pray in the Spirit for a few minutes because I was just so excited. Then I'd hit play again, listen to some more, and I'd stop and pray in the Spirit. Well, you know what praying in the Spirit does? The Bible says it edifies you. It's, it, it charges. It's like a, a, a spiritual, it's like a spiritual charging, like a battery being charged. You know, you plug your phone in, that's what that Greek word edifying means. It charges you. Over to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, going back to the fundamentals of faith, go to 2 Kings chapter 5. We see here that this man, Naaman, he was a captain of the host of the king of Syria. And we... Uh, you can read down, it says that he suffered. He was a mighty warrior, but he suffered from leprosy. And we don't have time to read all through it, but you begin to see that he heard about this uh, prophet Elisha, this man of God. And uh, he had a need, didn't he? And so Naomi and got his crew together, and they went down to visit him with all his horses and chariots. And they waited at the door of Elisha, but Elisha didn't even go out to meet him. Boy, there's, there's something to learn in that. Amen? Instead, he sent a messenger, and the messenger goes and tells Naaman, he says, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. That sounds easy, doesn't it? Did you hear me? That sounds pretty easy. It's amazing how simple and easy the Word of God is oftentimes. And sometimes people miss the very power of God because they're looking for something complicated. They're looking for something spectacular. You know, the Bible says he sent his word and healed their disease. He sent his word to heal our disease. He sent his word. Say he sent his word. He sent his word. Do you know that you can receive healing right in the middle of a service? The word of God's going out. You can just sit there and go, that word's being sent into me right now, healing all disease in my life. Amen? I've had testimonies of people said, I, I just came to church here, was listening to the word, and I got healed just sitting right in the service. I remember right when we had begun, we were over in the little plaza over there, and, and there was a, a young lady that came to our church, her and her family, and she had a had always a desire to be filled with the Spirit of the Lord and to be able to speak in other tongues. And, but she, you know, had heard different things about that and wasn't quite sure about that. But she just had this, this desire on the inside of her to be filled with the Spirit. And right when I was just ministering, she just received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And she got her prayer language. And she didn't tell even anyone at, at that moment when it happened and she was so excited. And it had been, I think, weeks or months later. And she finally came up and said, I wanted to tell you this. See, it's not in the spectacular. Hey, hey, the, the man of God said, uh, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. And the leprosy will be gone. You'll have new fresh skin. That's easy. Well, you know what it boils back, right back down to? Being a doer 
of the Word of God. See, Elisha wasn't just coming up with something complicated or something silly for him to say. He was acting. He was a messenger for God. He was a prophet of God, giving message to people. <laughs> and it says that, uh, he says, why shouldn't I wash in them? He's talking about the other rivers. I'm in verse 12, the last part of it. So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. Mm. Why do you think that was? You ever think about that? You know, wh wh why did he turn away in a rage when he simply just asked him to go down to the Jordan River? Well, there's a, a, you know, there's a, could be a number of things. Could be, I've heard and read that the Jordan River was a dirtier, muddier river than the other rivers. That, that could be it. And obviously... Um, if there's bacteria, you, you know, in that river, uh, if it's a muddier, dirtier river, and you had leprosy, which is, a, you, know, uh, you know, skin disease, you wouldn't want that getting in your skin and making it worse. That, that could be, could have been what it is, right? And that's why maybe he reasoned, why not the other rivers, why the, the Jordan River? But whatever the case may be, he turned and went away in a rage, you know, that would have been, if it wasn't for his buddy here that, that says something to him in just a minute, Naaman's life it would have been over prematurely. Did you hear me? That leprosy, he would have succumbed to that leprosy. I mean, it killed people. I mean, it ate their flesh off the bone. And he had leprosy. And even though he's a mighty man physically, as a warrior, he, he's trying to figure out how to stop this, you know, this disease. I mean, he's doing what he knows to do. He's just, he's kind of just grasping at straws, if you will. And, and he hears about this from, you know, serving at his house. And it says that his officers tried to reason with him. And he says, sir, <laughs> if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go wash and be cured. See, again, it's just getting right back to the fundamentals of faith. Your answer oftentimes is it's right there in front of your face. It's so easy. It's so simple. And I believe it's so easy even for us today in 2020 you know what we got to do? Just be a doer of the word. Just be a doer of the word. What the word says, I do. That really, faith is not that complicated. But faith, the fundamentals of faith will always produce measurable results. When they acted on the prophet of God saying, go around that Jericho Six days, and on the seventh day, go around it seven times, blow the trumpets and shout, and the walls will fall down. They acted on that, didn't they? And the walls fell flat. Here's Naaman. He's dying of a disease, a dreaded disease with no cure. He says, man, he just asked you to go dip yourself seven times in this Jordan River, and you'll be cured. It really isn't that complicated. I mean, it's, I'm paraphrasing. You came all this way. You might as well just Try it. <laughs> Just do it. Just act on what the prophet of God said. You obviously had some degree of faith to come here to ask him to begin with. I think you're offended because he didn't come out and talk to you. See, you wanted respect. Are you here to get respect or are you here to get cured? See, what it is, is a lot of times you have to train your senses. Well, I don't believe like that. Well, I don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in speaking in other tongues. I don't care if you don't believe in that. that, that that's up to you. You can choose to believe that. It makes no difference to me at all. I'm going to present to you what I know and what I've learned and what I've experienced And, you know, I don't know, I heard Dominic say this, I know 
We heard this from other people too. It's like telling somebody, it's like trying to tell me, you know, that there's no water in the swimming pool while I'm sitting there doing the backstroke in the swimming pool. Um, well, you can think there's no water in the pool all you want, but I'm swimming in it. I'm living in it. I'm experiencing. And here he says, <laughs> certainly obey him when he says simply go wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed. As the man of God had instructed. Now praise God today, we have the Spirit of God who gives us instruction. We have the Word of God to give us instruction. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. And it says, and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was you know God's still in the business of healing skin disease if you're here if you're watching online or listening to this message and you have an issue with your skin right now I'm going to pray just came up in my spirit in the name of Jesus I pray for anybody that hears this message who is dealing with any type of skin disease, any kind of issue with their skin. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. It does not matter at all. But I proclaim in the name of Jesus Christ for your skin to be whole, for you to be healed of that, for that never to be an issue another day of your life. Whatever it is, whatever name it's been given, perhaps, I tell it to dry up and to disappear from your life. And I pray over your organ, your skin, in the name of Jesus, to grow, to replenish, to be revitalized in the name of Jesus Christ. Irritation, rash, itching, flaking. Don't you ever return in the name of Jesus. You are dried up at the root from this day forward. There would not be any evidence or any, even any scarring that you existed. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Say from faith, faith. To, faith. to faith. The just shall live by faith. You know, your faith should constantly be increasing. Let's go one more place here. Just listen to the Lord to close. Luke 17, 5. I'm not sure when we are, but just let's go and I'll just follow the Lord here. Luke 17, 5. The apostle said to the Lord, Show us how to increase our faith. Say that with me. Show us how to increase our faith. Huh. The Lord answered and said, If you had faith even as small as a grain of mustard seed. Somebody just gave this to me. It's a little bottle of mustard seeds. thought it was kind of cool. I didn't want to put it in my office. I wanted to put it here. I mean, there's enough mustard seeds in here to go around multiple times for the amount of people that are in this room. That are in this room. And he's saying, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, I mean, there's hundreds of little mustard seeds in this little bottle. If you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say into this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would 
obey you. Again, if you see this picture, you are using what God has already given to you. Remember we've read in the scripture, God has given to every man the measure of faith. And I've likened faith to a muscle and said, hey, you use the muscle, exercise the muscle, the muscle gets stronger. And here the disciples are asking Jesus to increase their faith. It's interesting that he says, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you'd say this mulberry tree. To me, what he's saying is just use what you, I've already given you. Because even just a small measure what I've already given you will work for what you need to accomplish in your life. Amen? Amen? And so, he says, if you have faith, even as small as a grain of mustard seed, you should say to the mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What's it obeying? It's obeying the faith in you. You by yourself, the mulch fairy tree isn't going to do anything. But you, with faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, that mulberry tree has to obey. You know what's obeying? It's obeying the spiritual force of faith that God put in you. Amen. Glory to God. Mm. Go to 2 Corinthians 10, 15. They wanted to increase their faith. He begins to teach them to use the faith that they had, right? Again, it's like that muscle. Use it. You want it bigger? Use it. You want it to grow? Use it. You want to do great things in the kingdom? Use what you got. Apply it to your life now. Apply it to your work. Apply it to your business. Apply it to your marriage. Apply it to your health. Apply it to your city. Apply it to your neighborhood. Hallelujah. But a lot of Christians, oh, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen to happen. No, you've got to use your faith for it to happen. I like what one man said years ago. He said, Lord, save Africa. He said, I will when you go. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10, 15. Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. That your faith will grow. Say, my faith will grow. Faith has a great effect on a person's life. When a person becomes born again, the Bible says you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, right? And they're saved. Well, would they believe God you can believe, as you grow in these things, I'll, I'll just talk personally, you begin to grow in the knowledge of the word. You begin to increase in the knowledge of the word. That gives you opportunity to exercise faith in an increased area of your life. What is it that one person says? That your faith doesn't ex extend beyond the knowledge of the word. As you have knowledge of the word, you can exercise faith in that word, right? And as you exercise faith in that word, you begin, it grows stronger in that area. Well, I mean, for me, where healing is concerned, you know, I, I'd heard about healing growing up, but guess what? You know, yeah, um, I, I, you know, as a kid, you hear, I heard it in my household, which I was blessed to be able to hear about it, but then you got to, be a doer of the word. I don't care who you are. Every person has to be a doer of the word. And I remember, like, I, I've told this story before. I was playing baseball in the, one of my, you know, friend's house. And I remember because it was Sunday afternoon. Now, in my house, we went to church a lot. Thank God for it, but we went a lot, okay? So, I mean, it was, it was Sunday morning. It was Sunday night. It was Wednesday night. Then we had music practice. Then we always had something else. It was, it was church a lot. Thank God for that. That's, that was our routine. That's what we did. But here's Sunday afternoon. So Sunday afternoon was always like 
I don't know, stay close to the home, take it easy, because we got to go back to church a little bit. And my mom was in music ministry, so that always meant we were early, and we stayed late. That's just the way we rolled, all right? So I remember Sunday afternoon, it was always kind of like, don't get dirty, smelly, stinky, you know. And you're a kid, and you just want to go out and just do what kids do. So I'm playing baseball over at this kid's house, and the kid hits the ball, and he throws the bat and hits me in the face with the bat. It was swinging through the air, bam! When it happened, it hit me so hard that my teeth went all the way through my lip. And when, I mean, just blood just immediately began to flow out. And uh, everybody stopped when it happened immediately. They saw it happen. And without thinking, I'm a kid playing baseball with my friends. My friends aren't like we. (laughs) As soon as it happened, I spoke immediately. By Jesus stripes, I'm healed. You know why? Because that's what I was trained to do. I didn't yell. I didn't cuss. I didn't get mad at the other kid. My first response was what the word says. I was trained to do that as a child. That that would be my response. By Jesus' stripes, I am healed. My mom wasn't forceful. My mom was super, super loving where this was concerned. But she would say, well, what's our response? By Jesus' stripes, I don't care what it, I mean, I don't care if it was a paper cut, smashed finger. It didn't matter what it was. My mom would encourage me, by his stripes, you are healed. By Jesus' stripes, you are healed. I declare the word of God concerning you. By his stripes, you are healed. That was our, I didn't say ow. I said, by his stripes, I am healed. That was my ow. Other people, ah! That wasn't my response. I just, that's, but I've been trained. And I said, by his stripes, I am healed. And I run over there, and they, they come here, come here. And they had a garden hose. Yeah, back in the day, we drank out of the garden hose. I'm still here. All my hair fell out, but I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I know who didn't drink from a garden hose. You still have hair on your head, right? <laughs> right, Matt? <laughs> I, and I go over there, and we're, I got a garden hose going in my mouth, and I remember them going, oh, my gosh, there's a hole through his lip. Oh, my gosh, you can see through his lip. I'm, going, hey, hey, and I'm trying to feel my tongue and everything else. And then one kid goes, what did he say? What did he say? Well, what I would, I, I didn't just say it once. I said it more than once. That was my response. It was the response of by his stripes I am healed. By Jesus' stripes I am healed. And I remember going home. I'm like holding my hand over my mouth and I go up, my, you know, blood coming down here and I tell my dad, my dad's former medic, military, he goes, clean up, we gotta go to church. <laughs> Wouldn't like, let me look at it, son. Let me see if you're okay. <laughs> I go inside. You know, as a kid, you're like, my lip's going to fall off. What's going on? <laughs> I remember going in the mirror and seeing the hole through my lip. It was something to see. I get dressed, getting ready for church. Do you know, that as sure as I'm standing here, it was the first time in my personal life I experienced a miracle. We were driving to church. I'm trying to feel with that, my tongue. I remember, got to church and went and looked. It was completely gone. That hole that was there, there wasn't even like, it's begin to seal up, you know, and things like that. I'm telling you, the skin was as perfect and there was no hole through my lip. And I remember thinking as a kid, and what's, what's odd is, yeah, my parents knew about it. They didn't freak out, didn't flip out or anything about it, you know. I guess they knew I was going to be all right. 
And I remember going, this is like, um, this is actually a miracle because the hole was there. I stuck my tongue through it <laughs> in it like that. It was gone. And it was a good sized hole through my lip. We're not talking like a pinhole. Like you could, could see it. Stuff was coming through it. <laughs> it was evident. I'm telling you, it was completely gone. And I've had time after time in my life. And I won't go into the timing of the uh, time, of time because of time, I won't go into this whole story. But there was a giant shipping container. You know what a shipping connex container is? They, they put on the ship. They lowered big cranes. One of those fell off of one of our pieces of equipment. The guy hit the lever the wrong way. And it was a telephone pole. And my hand was in between that shipping container and that telephone pole. Dropped it down. Bam! Crunch. I could hear it. Crunch. Stuck in there. And I'm going... Lift it up, lift it up. And I begin to proclaim, by Jesus' stripes, I'm healed. I get my hand on there, I go. And I, I didn't even, when I happened, I didn't, I refused to look at my hand. Now I'm telling you, I wouldn't know, what to, I wouldn't know to do this. I wouldn't know to respond like this. It's not, this is not because, oh, I'm a tough guy. It's not that. I'm telling you, it's not that. This is a training of faith. And you train your senses to first respond by faith. And I am convinced that you can do this. And I stuck my hand under my arm. I refused to look at my hand because I knew if I looked at my hand, I would begin to respond probably in fear. And I remember because I reached, I grabbed my phone and I flipped it open. This is when I had flip phones. And I called my mom and I said, just pray. I hurt my hand, just pray. And that's all I said, click. <laughs> And go into details. And I went and sat down under a tree and I began, for me, and this, the guy that was with me, he was freaking out and I'm speaking God's word over my hand. By his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I am healed. By his stripes. And the pain was so great that I began to feel my knees begin to like get weak. And I went under, over under a tree and I sat down and the guy goes, we got to get you to the hospital. We got to get you to the hospital. And I said, just give me some cool water. And I sat under that tree and I began to pray in the spirit and pray in the spirit. And I'd, and I'd come back to my understanding. And every verse that, I, that came up in my spirit concerning healing was coming out of my mouth, people. I was speaking that out of my mouth, out of my mouth. What am I, I'm proclaiming, I'm proclaiming, I'm proclaiming. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does speak. That's a biblical, spiritual principle. God designed us to live that way. He designed us to live out of what is in abundance in our heart. That's why the enemy is so after the real estate of your heart. He's after that. But if you will commit to putting the word of God in your heart, in abundance... When you're under pressure, the word comes out. I'm, I've seen it over and over. It still happens today. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And this guy goes, you want me to get your truck? You want me to call 911? I said, no. Just give me some time. I sat there and I prayed. <laughs> and I probably sat there for 30 minutes and prayed. This kid was freaking out. He's calling his buddies. I smashed the boss's hand. I dropped the container. He smashed his hand. I'm hearing him talk. He called the next guy. What do I do? What do I do? And I'm praying in the spirit. He goes, he's, he's talking another language. I can't understand him. Because <laughs> he didn't know. He didn't know anything about this. <laughs> this is one of my younger brother's friends from high school. <laughs> and I did this. After I got like the settling in my heart, like I knew it was time, I pulled my hand out, and that's the first time I looked at it, and I went just like that. I said, all right, let's get back to work. That kid about passed out. <laughs> he could not believe that. And you know why? 
Because he didn't have faith in his heart from the word in order to be able to believe that. Believing doesn't come by seeing. Believing comes from the word. People say, well, I see it, I believe it. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because if there's no word of God in your heart, there's nothing to believe in. Hey, people make millions of dollars deceiving people with sleight of hand. They call it magic. Believing, seeing is not believing. The word is what produces believing in a person's life. And when you have the word, now you have the foundation for your belief. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Hallelujah. You can just begin to believe for healing. You can believe for restoration. You can believe for a new attitude. <laughs> if you've had a bad attitude in your life, you can believe God to help you with your attitude. You can believe God to help you with it, find a job. You can believe God to help you with your thought life. You can believe God to, to, to help. I mean, it just... It really is limitless what you can begin to believe God for. And, and we believe God, my wife and I believe God all along the way. We believe God for work to come in for our businesses. We believe God to be able to tithe and be able to give this certain amount. We believe God to be able to give car a car away, and then two cars, and then three cars. I think we're something like close to seven cars we've been blessed to, to give away, something to that number. And we just, just keep giving opportunities to give in, in, in this area, in that area. And we just believe God to be able to just keep on giving. But see, I'm constantly wanting to grow in my faith to be able to give more and be able to give more and be able to give more. See, now you became, become a resource in the kingdom of God. You know, God's the source, right? All I'm doing is resourcing what he gives me. Just using it, just, okay, yep, here we go. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for, for using us as a resource. You are the source. And we're just resourcing what you give us. Thank you, Lord. Those who are here, those who are listening, we all are at different places in our life. But I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that we'll begin to use our faith for greater things greater works greater accomplishments greater giving in your kingdom for your kingdom in your kingdom to be a blessing to others I thank you Lord for this body of believers for this church I thank you for the men and women that are here for their faithfulness for their giving for their fearlessness I thank God for their faith. Lord, you've called us for such a time as this. You've called this church to be a resource to the cities, to the state, and to nations. I thank you, Lord, for increasing us more and more, us and our children. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here in the room and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, to be the Lord and Savior of your life. I always want to give people that opportunity. Never want to assume that just because you come here that you're automatically a Christian. doesn't mean that. I found that out. Or if you're watching online or listening to this message in the future, contact our ministry. Let us connect with you. Let us pray with you and get some resources into your hand. Remember what the Bible says. It says that you're blessed. That blessing carries with it great things that blessing says that you are the head and not the tail that you are blessed going in and that you are blessed going out that you are blessed in the field that you are blessed in the city that your womb is even blessed right that you are the head and you are not the tail above and not beneath and that everything that you would set your hand to would do what and you're the lender not the borrower you're good looking you're dismissed God bless you see you Sunday you are here, moving in the midst, and I worship you, I worship you, oh, oh, we make a miracle work, promise.
Jesus keep light in the darkness of my God that is who you are oh we make a miracle work a promise keep light in the darkness of my God that is who you are that is who you are that is who you are 